One of our correspondents recently went to Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee with a very big into 3D printers, and we're going to take a look at that video. So let's go ahead and roll that tape. Future Talk staff member Greg Weinstein recently visited the Oak Ridge National Laboratory's manufacturing demonstration facility in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The researchers there, led by Dr. Chad Duty, are developing high-end 3D printers. This large printer, which prints in plastic, cost half a million dollars. This million dollar machine can actually print titanium parts. Here are some objects made with the printer, including titanium robotic hand parts. This bouncing ball is also made of titanium. Chad Duty discusses his views on the future of 3D printing. You're going to see it being more and more widely used in the consumer markets uh, to where your average person is going to see it on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And it's going to probably start off with niche applications, cell phone cover, covers, um, you know, little fittings, devices, replacement parts, things like that. But I think it'll go mainstream very quickly. I think what you're going to see is components will have added functionality that uh, in some cases will be apparent to the average consumer, in some cases it will be the hidden functionality that just makes something work better and you don't really know why. And that was our video from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Now what is the future of 3D printing regarding traditional manufacturing? Do you think that this could someday replace traditional assembly lines? There, You know, there are a variety of areas where 3D printing will ultimately, I believe, um, displace some, uh, some mechanisms, some methods that are used now. Um, I think that it's quite a ways down the road. Uh, it goes back to what Blaine said uh, as far as uh, speed and reliability. Um, but, uh, you know, th I think that they're going to be in the uh, use for development for, for quite a while. Uh, so prototyping parts, yeah. you can make a model of what something will look like, but as far as mass production, yeah. comparing it to something like injection molding, for example, which is a very right. inexpensive way of mass producing things. Right. Right. Or I've heard talk that at some point, maybe when you go to get a replacement part for an appliance, for example, that they won't actually ship in a part, they'll just print it for you on site. Right. And so that's a, that's a great goal, um, but we're years away from being able to print that in a reliable way. Um, for that to actually happen. But that is on the horizon. And so as material science uh, is able to kind of really wrap its head around what can be done with 3D printing to make it cure into the right dimensions and that kind of stuff, there's a lot of different materials that have been introduced. Um, and that's going to change a lot in the next five years. And that is going to be one of the breakthroughs that's going to probably facilitate the, these actually being used for production pieces. But right now, the primary goal, um, the best thing we can do with this is practice design work. Um, and get drafts. And for like a company to be able to do a draft print of this for a customer, um, it's a huge savings to the customer and to the company to be able to approve that rather than have to make one on any other machine process. So right now, it's in the prototype and drafting that it really has a big, big advantage. Now I understand there's another type of 3D printing technology. Instead of having a plastic thread, you have a bed of powder. And by selectively fusing pieces of it, you assemble your port right in this bed of powder then you just brush off the excess powder and you have your part. Right. Uh, is that a very similar technology that, to this? I mean, is there much difference between the two? Yeah, I believe Clay's actually operated those. Well, there, there's, you know, there's, there's several different methods for 3D printing. And the, the, uh, the, the powder bed that you're referring to, basically what goes on is you have a, uh, what's, what is in effect an inkjet head, and it's depositing resin into, into the powder, and it's solidifying that, that portion of the powder where you know where it's where it's ink, where the where the resin is being uh, um, placed. So it's injecting some material. It's not like a laser that's just heating at a distance. There's there's that method as well. Uh, there's a there's a great video on YouTube that uh, that shows a guy uh, that set this up doing sand melting sand using a using a, a mirror in the middle of the desert uh, with X Y Z access functionality. So, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, the well, and just on the other side of it, one of the more popular printers um, that's down at uh, the Autodesk facility, which supports us with all of our software, but they're the most popular one they have now um, uses paper and glue. 
And so uh, sometimes we can look to the future for all the space age material and science to solve the problem. Sometimes we can go back to tradition and realize that you know paper and glue produces a very inexpensive, pretty robust um, prototype as well, as long as it can be done accurately. You know, and that's what the CNC technology does for us in 3D printing. So I think we're going to see, you know, uh, use of materials really, really transform the whole thing. But I wouldn't say that it always has to be something space age looking forward. We're going to find some really traditional things that have been going to be remarkable. Now there's been a little bit of controversy here because some people say, well, you can manufacture your own guns with this, totally untraceable. You can get the plans right off the internet. Uh, do you think there's a problem that this could be put to some undesirable uses? <laughs> yeah, you know what, there's just about any tool we have in, in anybody's shop or garage can be put to undesirable purposes. And so that's really a moral problem and that's really something that you kind of have to solve in a different way. But I think technology, what it's supposed to do is present interesting opportunities for us to be able to make changes. And some of us will choose to make those in a positive way and some of us will choose not to. But to not make the, to not make the technology available would be a mistake. Yeah. The, the is there anything that 3D printing can do that cannot be done by other means? Like, does this enable yes. you to do things that you just can't do at all? Yeah, well, you know, so there are some examples here. These, the, the biggest thing that 3D printing allows us to do um, is make organic shapes. And so subtle curves um, and blends, these things are almost impossible to reproduce so uh, like in machine in any other way. So like dinosaur head. Yeah, and so this is a, a figurine, but yet, so this design is drawn by someone and designed um, and then printed. If you had to make this in any other way, there's no way you could reproduce this. Uh, you know, um, look at the, in this particular piece here. I mean, look, look at the, this. Is a this is a blade of a uh, in, this is a uh, a compressor blade for a for a jet engine for a turbofan, and that I mean, that would be a challenge to produce on a good day, yeah. with uh, with a variety of of tools. Uh, the fact that you, that there is inexpensive software out there. That uh, you know, a twelve-year-old kid can basically design a, a jet engine and actually produce a, a prototype to demonstrate that all the parts fit together. Now, it's it's remarkable. Some people say that what's missing now in three D printing is the so-called killer app. The use of it that's so valuable that it's worth it to buy the machine just to do that one thing. Like desktop publishing was the killer app for personal yeah. computers in the nineteen eighties. Now, you're looking for new uses. That's part of your field, right? Do you see any killer apps on the horizon? Yeah, you know, um, I can just say in a, in a general sense that we're working on some projects now that involve taking this quality grade printing um, and introducing certain kinds of enhancement that are going to make them structurally sound. And so then what you're going to be able to do is achieve these kind of complicated, consistent organic shapes, but also make them much stronger. And so we're right on the, right on the uh, forefront of doing that. We're going to see that shortly. Okay. Now, do you see big industrial uses like designing and building you know, airplanes or things like that, really heavy industry? Is it capable of that? I don't think in the turnaround that heavy industry requires yet. And so, but, but who knows where we're going to go? You know, there was a time when you know, personal computers you know, were huge and, and, and capable of doing almost everything. And you know, then they you know, came along to such a great degree. So 20 years from now, I would expect the ramp into this thing. Um, to be uh, totally, uh, you know, totally transformative. Where right now it's in the, it's in that leading and bleeding stage, you know. Um, but it's, we're certainly not ready to consider it for production now, and certainly not in an airplane part. <laughs> now, one use might be for people who don't have access to normal parts, like, let's say you're on the International Space Station, and a little part breaks down that's part of the oxygen distribution system. Yes, right. You can't store all the spare parts, and you don't want to wait months for another rocket to get there from Earth. But if you have a printer and a supply of raw material, you can pretty much replicate any part. They could beam you up for the uh, design. Yes, you I think that has, that has a real possibility. Right. And as the materials increase in their, um, in their, you know, in their structural rigidity, we're going to find that. There's also, we've had great talks about how to uh, use 3D printers in remote areas of the world because it's a fairly small footprint. We could send it out to uh, somebody and they can ma maybe print irrigation parts that you know, they can't uh, you know, get or they could do small medical devices or whatever. So both in space and on Earth, I think there's some great opportunities for what 3D printing is going to bring us. And this, present, this prints with one type of plastic, but they're also printers that have multiple heads so you can use multiple materials at the same time. Yes. To make yeah. more complicated. Uh, uh, and different <coughs> colors, and you know, so and uh, you know, there's a particular printers that print out materials that are like rubber and clear crystal, right. and they can integrate those. And so that's all right there, right here, right now. I guess it's good for artists as well because structural strength is not that critical. 
Yeah. You know, if you want to replicate a famous statue. Yeah, you know, um, we've seen that. We had a gentleman that we worked with that uh, 3D printed, that had a sculpture that was uh, high, widely valued, but now he wanted to reproduce it in a smaller set. So he brought it to us to scan, 3D print smaller ones, and he made castings from that. And he's able to reproduce those at a smaller set for, of, of bronze castings that he offered. Um, and he made himself a nice chunk of money from it. So there's a, there's a place where this 3D printing is going to contribute to people's ability to have a business or the ability to, to, you know, to make some money. Well, this is really a great topic, and I'd love to learn more about it. Unfortunately, we're just about out of time, so we are going to have to wrap the show. I've been speaking with Clay Lambert and Brian Demlo, both aficionados, I could say, of uh, 3D printing. This is Marty Wasserman. Thank you for watching. Visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, we'll see you next time.